Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist community of the mountains. This is my time to remind you to turn off any devices that might make noise. And here we are, our final service of the month of creativity and our final service with our sabbatical minister, Reverend Janet Ani. We thank her wholeheartedly for all the ways she has guided and supported us. With the basket of black oat acorns that sits on our altar each week, we express our heartfelt desire that the Nisenan people may recover more and more of their rich cultural heritage. We commit to support them in these and other efforts in whatever ways we can, under their guidance and at their request. And now our opening song, which is one of our old favorites, Wo, wo Ya Ya. Um, you'll rise in body and in spirit and join, join in singing. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm the Reverend Janet Ani, the minister holding the place of Reverend Kevin Tarsa, who will be back from his sabbatical next week at this Unitarian Universalist community of the mountains in Grass Valley. Whoever you are, whatever your skin color, whatever your gender identification or sexual preference, whatever your cultural identity, economic status, physical or mental abilities, or any other identity that has kept you from revealing your whole self, you are welcome to make a home in this time and space. In solidarity with the indigenous peoples across the United States, I acknowledge the land on which I make my home is the home of the Monacan Indian Nation, one of the few Native American groups still residing in their ancestral homeland of 10,000 years. They are recognized as one of the seven indigenous tribes in the state of Virginia. Today, we are highlighting the creativity 
of wordsmiths, specifically the poets and the tellers of stories. Stories have been the jumping off point for many sermons, for they tell of experiences that are both personal and universal. This morning, we'll examine the thoughts of a goat traveling in the back of a pickup truck to an unknown destination. And now, we light this chalice with the words from the poem for a new beginning by John O'Donoghue. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm for your soul senses the world that awaits you. Before we get to the story, actually, we have a little surprise for Reverend Jan. So you may have found on your seat or near you some lyrics to a song, and Eileen's going to put them in the chat for those of you on Zoom. It goes to the tune of Spirit of Life, which is familiar to many of us. And if it's not familiar to you, it's a pretty easy tune. You'll probably catch on pretty quickly. So you got your lyrics? You ready? <laughs> Dear Reverend Jan, we here thank you for someone when you practice a service with them. But we did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our story this morning is called The Ambassador and the Goat Herd. It's a story about endings and beginnings, and it's adapted from the Taoist tradition by Reverend Jeff Briere. A long time ago, there was once a young and wealthy statesman who was on a diplomatic mission. Pausing by the river at night, he heard the haunting sounds of a lute, which is kind of like a guitar. A musician himself, he took up his own lute and eventually he found a goat herd sitting on a tree stump. In those days, an aristocrat would not associate with a common goat herd, but the two men struck up a friendship through their music. Their playing was as smooth and natural as flowing water. Once a year, the ambassador and the goat hood would renew their friendship. Though they had the chance to play their music with others during the rest of the year, each man declared that he had found his true musical counterpart. The ambassador tried for many years to lift the goat herd out of his poverty, but his friend steadfastly refused. He did not want to pollute their friendship with money. Years later, when the ambassador was balding, he went to the appointed spot, but his friend was not there. He tried to play alone, 
but his melody was forlorn. Finally, someone came to tell him that his friend had starved to death during a recent famine. This news made the ambassador despondent. He was caught in the irony of knowing that he had the money and the resources to save his friend, and yet he understood the goat herd's pride and values prevented him from helping. In sorrow, the ambassador wanted to break his loot. With his friend gone, the ambassador could not imagine anyone else to play music with. He raised his lute high above his head and was just about to smash it against a rock when he heard a lark sing. And he thought, what a beautiful melody. And he wondered if he could play it. Now we will sing the children off to their classes. We come here today with our hearts and minds full of cares and concerns for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for the entire world. Struggles, worries, hopes, and joys. Such is life. Such is love. We have the opportunity now to connect with each other in this our symbolic weekly ritual of joys and sorrows. When the music starts, if you are so moved, I invite you to come forward and select one of these stones and release it into this bowl of water, symbol of our caring community. In this way, perhaps what feels deeply personal may also feel communal. Our burdens made lighter and our joys made brighter, knowing they and we are part of something shared. Those on Zoom are invited to participate by writing into the chat.
I've placed these final stones to symbolize all that we hold in our hearts today. Spirit of life and love, known by many names and yet fully known by none. We give thanks for this time and this place of renewal. We give thanks for the ability to begin again after meeting the challenge set before us. Grant us the courage to continue on the journey, the courage to speak up for the well being of others and ourselves and the planet. May we forgive each other when our courage falls short, and may we try again. Grant us hearts to love boldly, to embody our faith and our values in living words and deeds. May our hearts open to embrace humility, grace, and reconciliation. Grant us the ability to learn and grow to let the spirit of love and truth work its transformation upon us and within us. Grant us a spirit of hospitality, the willingness to sustain a fit dwelling place for the holy that resides in all beings. Grant us a sense of peace in the world, even as we are in motion. Let us cultivate together the strength to welcome every kind of gift and all manner of ways to be on the journey together. To this, we add the silent prayers of our hearts. I'm often reminded of the truth I learned from the first philosopher in my first philosophy class. That truth, announced by Mr. Heraclitus, is that everything is flowing, everything is in flux, changing, becoming. Modern process thought reiterates the theme, even the stubborn stability of a stone is the dance of electrons, pliant, interacting responsive in its relations to new conditions, forever changing in the march of time, the real of reality. Our own human destiny, even for the most stable of us and the most protected of environments, is a whirling dervish. You remember Eve's first words to Adam? My dear, we're living in an age of transition. This is our joy and agony, our burden and being. We must choose every moment how we will relate to the new world of borning in our midst. We change and are changed in the flow, the, the flux, the process, the grand passage of being. That's why Whitehead said the pure conservative is fighting against the grain of the universe. We must be ready for change constantly in ourselves, our relations, our church, our world. We can move creatively and with some intentionality with this process or be dragged by it utterly. The choice is ours. 
The first wisdom is not to be stuck, unyielding, unresponsive. To remember, my dears, that we are living in an age of transition. Shall we be dragged or shall we dance? Change yourself and not the world. The COVID pandemic has forced us to make significant changes in our assumptions about the way we live our lives. Your earlier incidences of unusual weather patterns, drought followed by excessive snow and rain, have changed the way we think about our climate. A new, albeit temporary minister, has changed the way that you view your religious community. Your beloved minister is returning from a period of renewal. Who knows how this time away has changed him? Change is a tricky and often uncomfortable thing. Process theologians, Whitehead, Hartshorn, and Wyman, gave us a way to think about change. They posit that change is a constant, that everything in the universe is in motion, constantly creating something new. Furthermore, we humans are co-creators in this process of change. Well, okay. But what they didn't leave us with a, is a checklist of things to do to fulfill this co-creator role. Today, I thought I'd offer a suggestion or four on how to cope with the uncertain outcomes of change. In other words, how to change ourselves. And since the theme of the month is creativity, I'm going to be using a story as the basis for our meditation. This is a story told by a more current process thinker, Unitarian Universalist minister and author, Reverend Meg Barnhouse. Reverend Barnhouse channels the feelings of a goat in a pickup truck en route to an unknown destination. Come with me now to imagine a place on a winding back country road. It could be somewhere around Grass Valley, but in fact is in the state of South Carolina. It's a crystal clear morning in the spring. Listen to the words of Reverend Meg Barnhouse. Some sites in this world embed themselves in memory and encapsulate a truth about life in a way that words just can't. I saw one of those one day when I came upon fast behind a slow flatbed pickup truck on a mountain road. In the back of the truck was a man holding a goat. The goat was standing stiff-legged and the man was talking to it. The goat was trying to look over the side of the truck bed but the scenery whizzing past was no comfort. The man, who had warm brown skin and the clothes of a farmer, kept talking in its ear. Slowly, the goat folded its legs and sat down in the man's lap, lifting its head into the breeze, eyes closed, it finally relaxed. I have a real affinity for goats, which is indulged by my friend Louise. <clears throat> Louise gave up a lucrative career as a Washington DC attorney to become a goat farmer. She describes this less than lateral career move as her salvation. Having been raised on a farm myself, I can understand the impulse to return. It's not so much that farm life is simple, it's not. What it is, is straightforward. Louise's goats are pretty straightforward. They eat, they sleep, they reproduce, and they give up their cashmere coats once a year. Whatever relational difficulties they have, they either keep to themselves or work it out by butting their heads until someone has had enough. As far as I can see, 
They only get anxious when their schedule is disrupted, when something changes, like being put in the back of a truck. Then they become anxious. Here's what Meg Barnhouse says. I recognize that situation. I have been a goat in the back of a pickup truck heaving itself around mountainous curves, out of place, out of my element, deeply confused with no helpful experience to help me deal with my predicament. Sometimes there is someone whispering in my ear, just stay calm, sit down, give up. Everything's going to be all right. In such a situation, the first thing I want to do is keep my feet. I want to stay up, ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. I want to see over the side, even though that only makes things worse. I can't figure out if I'm on my way to a better place with deeper grass and better company, or whether I'm being transported to the slaughterhouse. My friends, I don't wish to be indelicate, but I want to point out that the slaughterhouse is the final destination for all of us. We are given death at the same moment we are given birth. I don't think the question of destination is really the point of this story. I think what Barnhouse and I are asking us to think about is the way in which we decide to ride in the truck. How are we going to handle the fact of our fear of change, our fear of the unknown? How are we going to find the courage to relax a bit? There's a lot of advice on how to deal with anxiety and fear, how to muster up some courage. To paraphrase our James Luther Adams, I call that person free that does not cringe in despair but is lured by the divine persuasion to respond in hope to the light that has shown and that still shines in the darkness. What is that light to which JLA refers? I would suggest that it is our liberal religious values, hospitality in an uncertain world, neighborliness even across species, forgiveness that we aren't as brave as we might be. Compassion in the face of our fear, a generosity of spirit and above all, tender loving care. I think that farmer's lap in this story is a metaphor that we find the, in the comfort and we find in these universalist values. But I also think our Unitarian reason is also at play. We often don't know where we're going, but can understand that making a premature decision to fight, freeze, or flee doesn't serve us well. As Barnhouse suggests and logic dictates, we need to let go until such a time as action is possible. Barnhouse continues the story. The man who had warm brown skin and the clothes of a farmer kept talking in its ear. Slowly, the goat folded its legs and sat down in the man's lap. Lifting its head into the breeze, eyes closed, it finally relaxed. While Barnhouse doesn't tell us the words this farmer used to help the goat find the courage to let go and relax, I like to think it was something like what parents say and do to fractious babies. By simply being a non-anxious presence and murmuring comforting sounds, many babies will relax into waiting laps. We need to do more of this for each other. Unitarian Universalists are often packed into truck beds, whizzing off to marches, demonstrations, volunteering at food pantries and elementary schools and clinics and chairing meetings of organizations dedicated to affecting social justice. When we're not on that particular truck route, we're being driven to book clubs, discussion groups, concerts, lecture series, and workshops. I only need look at the list of activities you all are involved in, individually and collectively. 
We Unitarians are a lot of wonderful things, but relaxed is not a term that immediately comes to mind. <laughs> relaxed in the 21st century is a very countercultural state of being. So what can we do to nurture ourselves and each other so we find the energy to appropriately and effectively respond to the fear-inducing world that we live in? The goat offers an idea. The whole time I hear a voice saying, just sit for a while and relax. Surrender to events. Don't try to intervene at this time. Detach yourself from outcomes. The goat says, I don't know whether the voice is from the spirit of life or the goat meat factory. Eventually, I figure out there's nothing to be done at this point. My fear isn't helping. My feet can't help. My alertness is working against me. I need to let go until such a time as action is possible. I decide to enjoy the nice voice in my ear, to sit down, to gather my thoughts, to worry about it all later. To worry about it all later. How's that strategy working for us? I've heard the opinion that Unitarian Universalism ought to be called the Church of the Second Opinion. That's ridiculous and a little insulting. I've never seen a Unitarian Universalist congregation with only two opinions. Our free church attracts creative, curious, energetic, imaginative, and opinionated people who dream dreams and see visions. All of this makes us highly susceptible to turmoil and uncertainty. In these situations of uncertainty, it might be helpful to imagine the goat in the back of a pickup truck coupled with the words of the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There are a couple of things at the GOAT that we can't change. One thing we can't change is knowing for sure the identity of the mysterious driver of the truck. We can guess that we're being driven by the media or the government or broken family systems or corporate greed or however you choose to name the ground of our being but we really don't know what or who is in the driver's seat. Our destination is also a mystery. Is this a route that really will end in green pastures besides still waters? Are we on the way to the breeders with lots of goats to choose from? Or is this the road to the slaughterhouse? Since we don't know the driver's instructions or intentions, we don't know for sure where we're going. We could change our situation by jumping out of the truck, but that would leave us possibly injured and certainly alone. We are obligatory gregarious creatures. We are not designed to function in isolation. We seem to be better able to cope with uncertainty than with loneliness. So really, given the available options, the wisest choice is to relax. Barnhouse concludes her story by observing, I have worked hard to find my place, to find my strength, to surround myself with trusted voices. Every now and then though, I still find myself in a goat in the pickup truck situation. And so do we all, my friends, so do we all. How are we going to ride in the pickup truck of our lives? What are some ways we can have a more comfortable journey? One way is to tell stories. Barbara Brown Taylor said, it is not that the facts don't matter, it's just that they don't matter as much as the stories do. And stories can be true, whether they happen or not. Stories can be true, whether they happen or not. 
You let the story come to life inside you. And then you decide on the basis of your own tears or laughter, whether the story is true. If you are in any doubt, it is always a good idea to watch other people who have listened to the story. Just pay attention to how the story affects them over time. Does it make them more or less human? Does it open them up or shut them down? Does it increase their capacity for joy? Along with the stories, another way to ride in the pickup truck is to learn as much as you can about the possible routes and what you might encounter along the way. Do the research, read the maps, check out the chambers of commerce along the way, consult different travel guides. Having options helps ease anxiety. You at UUCM are highly skilled at researching options. A third way to ride is to become actively engaged in the ride. Poke your head over the side and assess the situation. Maybe it is a good idea to jump off the farmer's lap, especially if you see a herd of like-minded goats in a nearby pasture. You don't know what action to take until you have a look at what's around you. Finally, and I think most important, Meditation or centering prayer or some other form of spiritual practice will help give us the confidence that we'll know what to do once we get to where we're going. Barnhouse closes with these words. May I be given the wisdom to know when to sit and just let my ears flap in the breeze. I will close by echoing that sentiment. Let's meet the challenge of change by relaxing into the lap of our liberal religion, remembering our liberal religious values of hospitality, neighborliness, forgiveness, compassion, generosity of spirit, and above all, tender loving care. And may our ears flap in the breeze of the murmuring voices of our free faith. May it be so. Amen. <clears throat> Each week, we share 25% of our offering with a community nonprofit that shares our values and puts them into action. This month, Child Advocates of Nevada County will be the recipient of your generosity. Specifically, donations will go to the Court Appointed Special Advocate Program, the CASA program, which trains volunteers to support children and youth who are under the supervision of the court due to abuse and neglect. CASAs walk alongside their child through the entire experience sometimes for years. Of the many people involved, they are the only ones that are solely dedicated to determining the needs of the child and advocating for them. Your generosity remains essential to our ability to sustain the work of our community. There are several ways to contribute. You may text an amount to 833-579-0483, give via our website at uugrassvalley.org, via PayPal at paypal.me slash uucm, or mail to uucm 246 South Church Street, Grass Valley, California, 95945. Thank you.
Thank you for giving generously. We dedicate these gifts to keeping children safe and providing environments and opportunities for them that they may fulfill their highest potential. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody that put this service together. Toby, of course, for the music, the super sound, super sound team back there. Um, George for his work behind the scenes, Eileen as chat host, Shanti for once again a beautiful, beautiful setting. The greeters, Gwen, Laura, Car, Corey. Um, refreshments is Beth and the Kids Connection upstairs, Lindsay and Cheryl. Lots of things coming up. The budget meeting, welcome back Kevin next Sunday, uh, with, and the community business meeting also next Sunday. And of course, you can always find out more at our website, uugrassvalley.org. And before we go into our closing song, I have some closing words actually for Reverend Jan. This is an ode to Reverend Jan. We were down to mere days. Rev Kev's leave was looming. No replacement in sight. Our anxiety was blooming. We knew we could manage to go it alone, but the prospect of doing that caused many to groan. Then, lo and behold, we could be of good cheer and throw off our gloom. Rev Jan did appear. <laughs> she opened our minds, we opened our hearts. Zooming could work if we all did our parts. A learning experience for all, no matter how trite that sounds. It's been a quite a ride, some ups and some downs. You've been a huge help. We can't thank you enough. And now, saying goodbye, we're finding it tough. We wish you the best, all the things you desire. And now, we must ask, will you really retire? <laughs> Somebody has to fight the squirrels. <laughs> and you're just the one to do it, I can tell. <laughs> okay, now we're ready for our closing, closing song. And this has a little bit of audience participation. When you get to the last verse, you'll notice there's some blanks for you to fill in. But you know this one. You know what to do.
laughter, laughter, okay. Today, as we say goodbye to Reverend Jam and prepare to welcome back Reverend Kev, we are reminded that all is impermanent. Everything is flowing, changing, becoming. It is not possible to force transitions. They happen at their own pace. During these times, it makes sense to sit down, turn your face toward the sun, close your eyes, and let your ears flap in the breeze <laughs> as we carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. All right, see you all next week. And you're invited to bring an item of delight, something that brings you delight we will be creating together. Bye. Bye.